11 days before her 89th birthday, Esther lay on her bed, shallowly struggling with the last breaths of life. At her side, her husband Lawrence of 66 years sat holding her hand. Their life together had not been a fairy tale. There had been plenty of struggle and pain, like when they lost the farm. All of the complications dealing with Esther's frequent bouts of anxiety, and of course, the baggage that Lawrence carried all his life as the son of an abusive alcoholic. They fought about money and sex and religion. They fought about how to discipline the children and whether or not Esther had the right to tell Lawrence what to eat. But none of it was more painful and none of it tore at their marriage and ripped at their hearts like the pain they felt when their oldest son was killed in Vietnam. And now here they were at the very end of Esther's life. And Lawrence leaned in a little, not knowing for sure if she could hear him, but sensing that she could. He leaned in and he said, well, you've given me 66 years of heaven. I guess it's your turn. And Esther's lips parted and she whispered, you, you are heaven. Esther and Lawrence could call it what it was because they knew what it was. The wisdom of life's journey had taught them how to recognize heaven. The rest of us struggle. We grope with metaphors and images. We wrestle with complex parables, trying to understand what is this kingdom of heaven. We cling to images of pearly gates and eternal banquets, which are nice images they're lovely and they're warm, but if truth be known, they're not real helpful. You can't sink your teeth into them. Our catechism tells us that the kingdom of heaven is the place of God. And each time it uses it, it distinctly puts quotation marks around the word place to emphasize that it's not literal. It's not literally the place of God. It's experiential. It's a, a state of being, a state of mind, a place of heart. And what does that mean anyway? A place of God. What does that mean when we're taught all along that God is love and God is everywhere always? Is heaven the place of love? Can it be that heaven is everywhere always? Perhaps, maybe, and yet we pick up a newspaper and we read just a short while and we think, not in this lifetime. As small children, we're taught that heaven is a reward for good behavior, sort of an eternal paycheck for a job well done. And we, we cling to that notion too. It's hard to shake because on some level that seems to make sense. It seems just, it feels rational. But spirituality is not limited by the narrow confines of the rational. And as we grow in our spirituality, 
we come to the realization that heaven is not a reward. It can't be, because infinite love is not something you earn. Unconditional love can't be given as a reward. That would be a condition. Infinite love is a gift, a gift from God, the gift of God. Esther and Lawrence had discovered that the kingdom of heaven is an ability you grow into through a lifetime of practice. It's the peace we feel in our heart when we place all of our trust in divine love. It's the, it's the peace we realize when we discover the kingdom of heaven is not about the absence of all struggles. It's the ability to transcend them, to rise above them. It is a perspective, a disposition, an attitude. The kingdom of heaven is an ability that we grow into through a lifetime of practice. And maybe that's what life ultimately is. Practice for heaven. Perhaps the question we should ponder every night when we lay our heads on our pillows is, how did practice go today? And perhaps the question we ought to ponder every morning when we get up is, what will my practice regimen be today? How will I practice love? The Dalai Lama famously said that if you want others to experience happiness, practice compassion. And if you want to experience happiness, practice compassion. I think that idea translates very well to our own Christian truth. If you want others to experience heaven, practice love. And if you want to experience heaven, practice love. 